Welcome to Ideas Sunday. It's October 13th, 2019. A slave's eye view of escape from the antebellum South is on display here, but for realism, you'll be seeing the road to freedom the way those travelers saw it. You can really sense that kind of fear of the unknown, the fear of being detected, so it's really powerful. The Cleveland School transforms some of the lowest performing students into learners by giving them a new view from surface level. They've been given a confidence to do something that I don't think any of them ever thought they would be doing. And I couldn't remember how to throw one of these things, but eventually it came back to me. We meet a champion of the art and sport of boomerang. We throw and catch all over the world, and I've been throwing since, since I was born, really. I've been throwing from a very, very young age. Ideas Sunday is next. Brought to you by Westfield. Offering insurance to protect what's yours, grow your business, and achieve your dreams. Good morning, and welcome to Ideas Sunday. I'm Rick Jackson. We begin this morning in school, but not the way you may remember it. After all, you may have long-held perceptions about what goes on in an inner-city high school. Those could be based on past history, on innuendo, on someone's retelling of a decades-old circumstance. For those without reason to journey inside, know this, things have changed. Among the improvements is a series of small schools that cater to specific kids with specific needs. The Cleveland Metropolitan School District calls them Schools of One. We went to the flats to check out one of the newest Schools of One in a most unexpected setting. Yeah. All right, even one foot up and out. Hold your oars. Make no mistake, this is not the crew from Harvard, a collegiate powerhouse rowing Boston's famed Charles River. Nor are they the team from Penn, skillfully navigating the Schuylkill through Philadelphia. Lead away! Yeah. Newbies at rowing Cleveland's Cuyahoga River, these students are enrolled at the School of One at the Foundry, one of the very smallest educational institutions operated by the Cleveland Metropolitan School District. As you can immediately determine by its location, it's far from a traditional high school arrangement. Some kids are just used to more of a traditional school um, and everything that entails. Here they really have to be active. They're moving, they're doing things, whether it be work component, whether it be the rowing, whether it be their academics. So they're transitioning throughout the day. All of this aids to their personal growth and their self-confidence, which is great, but it's also not for everybody. CMSD master teacher Melanie Lynch instructs this assortment of students from across the city, kids who in some cases were all but abandoned, their hopes nearly discarded by a system generally too large to cater to an individual. You need 22 credits to graduate. You and need I the, listen, listen, you need the right 22. You need English 4 and you need Algebra 2. That's part of the 22. Schools of One are described by system leadership as designed to meet the needs of gifted, talented, and undecided students needing a more personalized environment. This group most decidedly fits that final category, not just undecided, but likely closer to last chance than almost any other students in Cleveland. The year before, collectively, where all of those students were in school, they were absent a total of 469 days. That was 79% of the school year. But offered a chance to apply for this particular school and a chance to each learn at their own pace with access to technical and personal assistance previously unavailable, Foundry Executive Director Peter Anagnostis says they've become simply students. Perfect attendance, 198 out of 202 days of the school year. And that's an extended school year. And these kids have to get up at 5 o'clock in the morning to get here. Not that it was a smooth or by any stretch a simple transition. The first time we learned about it, I was like so against it. Like I didn't want to get on the water. I didn't like the lake. I didn't like the lake. I didn't like none of it. And so like when they first got me on, um, it was like life changing because it's like you seeing Cleveland at a different angle because you only could see Cleveland. If you're on land, you only could see it. you limited to certain spaces. But in water, it's like, it's a better view of it. And so like that made me more aware to want to get on a water to see different views of it. Not just different views of Cleveland. This new school offered Jalen different views on life, on education, and on his future. 20 strokes, ready to row, 
Even among the schools of one, which vary in topic and focus across the system, this version is unique. Not just because classes are held in the historic building converted to house the foundry, Cleveland's Rowing and Sailing Center, but because the young men and young women here are also given the opportunity to hold down guaranteed jobs, putting real cash in their pockets every week, while contributing to a Cleveland business. Second year students Jalen Baldwin and Marcus Bell have been here since the foundry joined the program last year. They are among students who travel to Old Brooklyn after their school day is done. The global data protection company MCPC hires School of One students to deconstruct laptop computers to sort and categorize old technology, much of it for recycling. And the jobs will be here for them when they graduate as well. This was not easy when I first came here, so I had to really get on it and stick to the grind to get it. So I, I think it teaches you also responsibility because you cannot mess up. If you do, it costs the company money and it might you know, cost you your job. So you have to make sure that you stay focused doing it and you get the process. It's also a fun process. They aren't considered interns or student workers. They went through every process any employee would, background and security checks, the whole bit, because what happens here involves data that must be protected. Parts of the operation we can't even show you. In another part of the building, School of One senior Isra Rosa was working, unsupervised, deconstructing machinery that once held medical secrets. That is all left up to you, and it, it, it's an adult thing. You need to take that upon yourself and, and be responsible for that. And when you slip up, don't make any excuses, take accountability. So these are things I've learned just from being a part of this entire school and program. No, they don't sound like people that many would give up on. Not as they're tossing around words like accountability, encouragement, and most importantly, trust. For most of them, trust is not a positive thing. They've been burned by people that they've trusted in the past. They've learned trust doesn't get them anywhere. Um, being street savvy and maybe being a little hustler, that gets them somewhere. Um, but trusting people and listening to people, those types of skills, don't necessarily translate well in their world. So I think the biggest obstacle is that first and foremost, they have to learn to trust. They have to learn to trust this space. They have to learn to trust each other. They have to learn to trust me. Um, and once that begins, then a lot of other stuff just kind of falls by the wayside. And then the person, whoever they may be, starts to come through and that's what we want. That's reflected on the water as well, where teamwork is tantamount and that trust is everything. We have to build a trust with each other first before we get in the water because without trust, you can't go anywhere. And you might flip, have to swim to shore. So that's very important. They, they do feel uh, safe here. That's a big factor. Um, they've been given a confidence to do something that I don't think any of them ever thought they would be doing. Um, and that concept of team, it happens on the water too. All of those differences, BI from the east side, the west side, from the city, from the country, uh, black, white, Christian, Jewish, it all goes away. That diversity shows as well when kids from the inner city, white or black, and more well-to-do youth are on the water or in the workout rooms together. The Foundry engages about 5,500 middle and high school students a year, 70% of those from the city of Cleveland. And leadership would like to expand the school of one here. It will take as much cash as it will dedication, but the proof of success is sitting in those boats five days a week. I am proud of myself. I think anybody who's seen my growth from last school year to this school year would say that they're proud of me as well. I've made a lot of positive changes. A lot of them are mental. I think the biggest, the hardest part about school one is that uh, you have to work on self-discipline a lot. That is the number one thing, I, word, phrase, sentence I can use to describe what the, the number one key you need there is, is self-discipline. You haven't passed your swim test. <laughs> you meet them where they are academically and social and emotionally. And that's why I think it's very successful. And that's why the School of One as a whole is very successful. Going to an inner city school, people that go there don't really have an outreach like that. They don't know any other sports besides football, basketball, things like that. So when I heard about rowing, they were like, what is that? And you had to explain it to them. And I think if they looked into it and see how much fun it is, they get why it's a sport. And I feel like given a the chance, they enjoy it.
Those kids are certainly winners, but neither the Cavs, Indians, nor Browns brought a championship to Cleveland this year. But Logan Broadbent did. In August, the Clevelander took home the individual national championship in the sport of boomerang. Yes, boomerang is a sport. As Ideastream's Mike McIntyre discovered when he visited Edgewater Park with the champ, it's not an easy one to master. Logan Broadbent loves to play catch. You might see him at Edgewater Park or in some wide open space in the Cleveland Metro Parks. His right elbow tightly taped to protect his ulnar collateral ligament as he throws and catches for hours. Check this out. But you won't see anyone playing with him. His passion is a solitary pursuit. He's both thrower and catcher. That's the way boomerangs work. Boomerangs, it's a relatively complicated sport. There are actually six individual events that we compete in over the course of a tournament, and you have to specialize in each of those events. So first you have to have the right equipment that really works well in every different type of weather condition, and then you really need to know how to use it. So it takes years to, uh, you know, to learn your boomerangs, to learn the different skills and catches and events, uh, but eventually you kind of, uh, you know, you, you start to develop, you know, the, that expertise and, uh, and you start winning. Winning is something the 31-year-old Clevelander knows a lot about. He's the reigning U.S. champion of the sport of boomeranging, winning the title in Boise, Idaho in August, after finishing second the previous two years. He's also a member of the reigning world champion United States boomerang team and is its youngest member ever, having joined when he was just 14. He's been on the national team more than half his life. To become the best, Broadbent worked to master the six events in competitive boomerang. Accuracy, Aussie round, which combines distance, accuracy, and catching, endurance, fast catch, maximum time aloft, and trick catch, in which a competitor catches the boomerang in acrobatic ways and sometimes throws two boomerangs at once and catches them both in different ways. How did he get so good? First, genetics. Broadbent's father, Lakewood native and Canton resident Gary Broadbent, ranked number one in the country in 1997. He got into the sport as a child and became a boomerang evangelist in his teens. He still does presentations about the history and physics of boomerangs for school kids. It's coming back. Not Can't bad, right, on, right on target, on the just <laughs> like a pro. Now, that... Do you remember as a real little kid, him just sort of putting a boomerang in your hand and saying, throw it? Yeah, you know, he said that the first time I threw and caught a boomerang, I was 18 months old, but I, I don't know if that's true. It was one of those little boomerangs that probably just landed on me. But DNA only gets you so far. Broadbent practices at least three times a week and trains every day to keep his body in top shape. He's qualified for the Boston Marathon eight times, and he's a four-time competitor in the American Ninja Warrior television competition, known nationally as the Boomerang Ninja. And those ninja skills come in handy when one of his boomerangs gets caught in a tree. Here we go. Broadbent often attracts a crowd when he practices, and he's eager to teach newcomers how to become proficient at his craft. Even ones who aren't initially eager to look like a fool doing something they've never tried before. <laughs> well, I'm sure if I tried to throw one of these things, it would probably go about 10 feet and fall to the ground. You know, I think you'd be surprised. I think you may be able to throw and catch one today. Do you want to give it a shot? Actually, I... Oh, I'm not dressed for it. I mean, of as you can see, you I'm a journalist, dress like I'm dressed in this way. What I would need would be like a shirt and a pair of shoes and some shorts. I I, would... If only you had a pair of those. Wow, oh, well, I hey. guess we're... Oh, you got everything you need. Why don't I go change and I'll be back in a second. All right, see you in a second. Let me just say I have not been throwing a boomerang since I was a toddler. In fact, I'd never thrown a boomerang in my life. Broadbent was a patient teacher. You just throw it like a football, right? Yeah, you throw it overhand, very similar to a football. Not a frisbee. Definitely not a frisbee. Most people, a lot of people think you throw it sidearm, but boomerang's not going to come back that way. What I do is I tend to bring this wing back toward my forearm. That's what's going to allow you to get even more spin out of your throw. The throwing, it turns out, came pretty quickly. The catching was a bit trickier. A boomerang is not a baseball or a football. Not even a frisbee. It stopped! That was it! Oh, that was perfect! It was right there! That was so good! Oh, man! Oh, that was it! That was it! One more. Oh, that was perfect! 
That's perfect. Eventually, I got the hang of it, but I was a little eager next to a surefire Hall of Famer. A neophyte next to a legend. Long after I was done, Broadbent was still adjusting his airfoils, adding rubber bands for drag, throwing his boomerangs and making catches with his hands and sometimes with his feet. He should have charged a mission. When he finished, I climbed into my car, and he prepared for a long run. Because that's what champions do. I do not trust McIntyre with that thing. The legendary Renaissance artist Michelangelo likely never intended for people to see his sketches, yet they provide a window into how he created masterpieces. Up next, we head inside a new exhibition of his drawings on view at the Cleveland Museum of Art. Here's Ideastream's Carrie Wise. Michelangelo was a painter, sculptor, and architect. And throughout his career, he worked from sketches. We get the sense from these drawings that he had everything very well planned out before he started to paint. Emily Peters is one of the curators of Michelangelo, Mind of the Master. The exhibition features a couple dozen of Michelangelo's drawings, alongside replicas of some of his masterpieces, including the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel in Italy. So on the back of this sheet, it's just an array of different limbs and figures. And you can see that Michelangelo would rotate the sheet. He was, you know, working very swiftly probably and thinking through some of the different figures on the ceiling. This hand right here, this arm and this hand, those correspond to the very famous scene on the ceiling of God creating Adam. And that is God's hand, which you can see here. No pressure. You want to get the hand of God right. You want to get the hand of God right. He practiced it many times. On the other side of the paper, Michelangelo drew the figure of a muscular male nude. And he worked out the details of the body in motion down to the flexed toes. Two of the drawings for the Sistine Chapel that we have are for figures called ignudi, which is an Italian word meaning nude man. These were very important compositional elements in the Sistine Chapel, but they didn't have any narrative significance. Michelangelo used them to kind of punctuate the uh, narrative scenes in the middle of the chapel. And his contemporaries were completely astounded by these figures. Michelangelo's focus on the human figure continues to influence art today. He was working at a time when artists generally did not study anatomy yet, and also at a time when though artists would sketch from live models, they often didn't sketch from nude models. Both of those things are really key, even to this day, to art education. So which is this drawing here? So this is one of two drawings in the exhibition for a, a commission for a fresco called the Battle of Kashina. And it was his first big fresco commission for the city of Florence. It was a, a commission that he never completed. However, what we do have uh, are these wonderful preparatory drawings. And it was a moment when he's bringing his vision of the heroic male nude to a wide public. It's such a muscular, physical drawing and it, that he might look like his, he's about to race into battle, but it's, it's almost comical when you see the whole picture. Mm -hmm. He's not in battle yet, he's racing. Right. From, from Bath. Right. <laughs> so Michelangelo's concept for this fresco was that it was a great battle um, between Florence and Pisa, but he was portraying the moment when the soldiers were called to battle and they were caught uh, in the river Arno taking a bath. So this really played to his strengths because he could focus on the nude male figure and um, kind of the rushing aspect of getting ready for battle. These drawings have never been seen together in the United States and they once belonged to a queen. 
how did these be get preserved over the years to now be on view today? Well, it's really interesting. There are not very many drawings by Michelangelo that still exist, but we do know that this group of drawings was in the collection of Queen Christina of Sweden. She was a very interesting woman who abdicated her throne in the 17th century and moved to Rome. And she loved Italian art. And then throughout the centuries, those albums were sold to various collectors. And in 1790, they were sold to the Tyler's Museum, which is a museum in Harlem in the Netherlands. And they've been in that museum ever since, which is one of the reasons they're so well preserved today and are still together as a group. He was using these drawings 500 years ago as working tools. He never would have imagined probably that we'd be looking and walking through an exhibition of his drawings. That is true. Um, in fact, he was quite secretive. He knew that other artists were very interested in his design ideas. He was famous even in his own day. An artist in particular wanted to see his drawings because it was in his drawings where he was showing some of his invention. And so he actually came to burn large quantities of his drawings during his life. We assume, based on the way he worked, that he must have made tens of thousands of drawings during his long 88 years. However, today there are only 600 drawings remaining. In 1517, he asked a servant specifically to burn his drawings from the Sistine Chapel ceiling. So the ones we have today are really precious. And you're right, he wouldn't have expected them to be on view in an exhibition like this. Was it standard for artists to burn their work at this time? Not at all. Um, it was quite unusual, and I think it goes back to perhaps a particular personality of the artist who was quite guarded about his work, and I think with some justification felt that others wanted to look at and maybe take his ideas. I don't think it would have mattered who was on the ballot. It finally feels like we're getting traction on mm -hmm. this issue. We're trying to get the truth so the public knows what's happening. The group seeking to collect signatures to put Ohio's newly passed energy bill on the ballot is turning to the courts for help. House Bill 6 creates surcharges that will support nuclear power plants. Critics call the law a nuclear bailout. Ohioans Against Corporate Bailouts filed a lawsuit last week seeking an extension, asking more time to gather signatures needed for the referendum. As it stands, the group only has until October 21st to gather more than 265,000 valid signatures to have the issue placed on the November 2020 ballot. We discussed this story during our weekly Reporters Roundtable, including the claim by Ohioans Against Corporate Bailouts that opponents are using campaign records against them. Yeah, there's this lawsuit that's being heard right now in federal court. My colleague Andy Chow is there. And uh, the, the group Ohioans f Against Corporate Bailouts, who wants to overturn the bailout law, they want more time to do that. They have to have 266,000 signatures from all across Ohio filed by October 21st. And that's a really, really short time frame. And they say the actions of these other dark money groups that have been involved who support the bailout, they say their actions have made it harder for them to gather the signatures. They're talking about uh, Ohioans for Energy Security and Generation Now. These are two groups that have been running a video campaign. They've been having ads. They've had flyers. You've probably seen them in your mailbox that have uh, the Chinese flag on them and things like that. And, and they've also been sending out monitors, as they're calling them, people who have been going out trying to find people who are trying to gather signatures to overturn the bailout law. They're also showing up trying to persuade them not to sign. And their ad campaign right now is specifically designed 
designed to get people not to sign those petitions. The whole thing is about stopping this law before October 21st. Ohioans against corporate bailouts want to stop the law. And the other side will tell you it's because they are funded by natural gas interests. The people who want the bailout, they don't want to stop the law because they say without that bailout, Ohio's two nuclear power plants will shut down. It's all very complicated and it's really coming to a, a climax here fairly quickly in terms of that October 21st deadline. And we potentially could find out today if that will be extended or not, but it seems really kind of unlikely that the court would decide to extend that deadline beyond that date. There's a billion dollars riding on this. That's mm -hmm. what's going to show up on your electric bill to subsidize the nuclear plants and the coal plants. Uh, there's also a rollback of Ohio's green energy standards. There are a lot of issues involved. But when you're talking about a billion dollars, the idea that it, you, the, the proponents of the bailout do not want this to be on the ballot. They don't want the delay. They don't want the risk of having voters look at something called, you know, a, a bailout and, and say no. So if they can stop it now, they will. They're in court themselves to try to claim that this is a tax and taxes cannot be challenged by referendum. So you have that court action. But I think Karen's right. Uh, courts have been really hesitant, federal courts especially, of stepping into issues of how state elections are run and what the rules are. Yeah. Two quick points. The proponents of this bailout, which are attempting to s discourage people from signing, are running a campaign that's as sleazy a campaign as an underhanded and misleading as we, we've seen in Ohio in a very mm -hmm. long time. And it's unavoidable. It is, it's in your mailbox, it's on commercial radio, it it's is, on your TV. It is disgusting. Mm -hmm. uh, but they want to they want to nip this in the bud now by spending X million dollars because if it goes to the ballot, they will have to spend ten times that much. Mm -hmm. That's why they're leaving no you know they're trying to shut this down right as now. Quickly it as saves possible. it saves money. Karen, go ahead. Yeah, you asked me a question that I didn't quite answer there, and I want to go back to that. Okay. Um, what Brent's saying is really interesting there in that um, the, the idea that uh, they're trying to stop this before it goes forward because they're going to have to spend more money to fight it. That's a question that I think we'll, we'll have to ask if indeed the law does get stopped and this does go to the ballot because the, owners of the, the owner of the two nuclear power plants, First Energy Solutions, has said without this bailout, they would not be able to continue to operate. So that's a real question going forward. Forward, would there even be this potential vote next year because will the power plant shut down or not? First Energy Solutions has been saying over and over that they would shut them down. But back to your question about uh, th the idea of these people who are gathering the signatures, the circulators, they are, they have to sign a form that says their name, their address, uh, phone number, this sort of thing. And the Ohioans Against Corporate Bailouts group, the anti-bailout group, they say that that information about their petition gatherers, their signature gatherers, is being used against them. That they say the other side is now using that information and targeting the people who are trying to get those signatures, following them at home and, and running ad campaigns saying that there are some people with questionable backgrounds here who are gathering your personal information. It is really an extraordinary campaign before it's even gotten to the ballot here. And part of the frustration, especially for reporters, is that you really can't know exactly exactly who's involved. You can make some educated guesses on who might be funding one side, who might be funding the other side. But with all the dark money that's involved here, nobody really knows. And the only side that has to disclose is the people who are gathering the signatures. They have to disclose 30 days after they file those petitions who actually funded their campaign. The other side, Ohioans for Energy Security and Generation Now and the other groups that are involved, they don't ever have to disclose because they're under a different section of the code there. On the sleaziness end of it, though, <laughs> but, I mean, yes, we have seen wildly misleading ads show up in our mailboxes and be in our TV sets. That's not new. What I think is incredible about this is to actually have hired blockers to follow these petitioners around to try to get people not to sign mm -hmm. petitions. One of those things that's been regarded as a core issue of democracy to get an issue on the ballot. It's un-American. It's almost un-American. It's, it it's just not been done like this before. And now there are allegations that they're actually hiring the petitioners 
a way to get them not to pass petitions anymore, give them a vacation or give them a job, a make work job, just to keep people from being able to and vote And we on have seen in, in a couple of cases some physical confrontations. Yes. Karen, wrap this up for us. And and that, that, those blockers, those are, I referred to the monitors earlier. Those are the, the people that uh, Generation Now has been sending those folks out. They claim that they're telling those people to be respectful, to just make the case for the other side. But people who are gathering the signatures say they're being stalked, they're being harassed, they're being crowded, they're being followed. And it's actually those arguments that are being used in that federal court lawsuit that's being heard today, the uh, Ohioans against corporate bailouts say those tactics are making it harder for them to get those signatures, to get to the ballot, so that's why they need more time. And it, it's important to note here that these are paid signature gatherers, because when you're talking about 266,000 signatures in a span of about six weeks or so, that's the kind of thing that a volunteer effort just can't do. So it, it's, it's a lot of money all around here, and we'll be waiting to hear from the federal court on whether they extend that deadline, but it sure seems like that won't happen. And on tomorrow's show, a conversation about how legacy companies in Northeast Ohio are embracing the digital future. Plus, our arts and culture team introduces us to Dominique Mariso, a playwright and Detroit native who will have plays produced on three different Cleveland stages this season. Watching Ideas Sunday, I'm Rick Jackson. Thank you for spending part of your morning with us. Still to come, a visual journey along the Underground Railroad. A new exhibit in Canton looks to capture the sense of an escaped slave's nighttime journey in pursuit of freedom. But first, about one third of people with autism now seek post-secondary education, according to Autism Speaks, an advocacy group. Many of these students require special accommodations, ranging from extra time in taking tests to help with making friends or navigating the campus. It turns out that Kent State University is a national leader in attracting students with autism spectrum disorders and offering them the supports they need to achieve academic and to social success. In fact, a Division I basketball recruit made headlines last year when he chose Kent because of its efforts and programs aimed at students with learning differences. In this encore of a piece we first shared earlier in the spring, Ideastream's Gabriel Kramer visited Kent to see what the university offers to non-neurotypical students. I have a daydream of a far off place. The great warm welcome will be waiting for me. Somehow, even with her two majors and one minor, women's chorus practice and her shift at the local mall, Kent State University senior Jordan Worrell still finds time to jam with her friends. Not bad, right? But don't take my word for it. Kristen Young and Monica Milenig are her jam buddies. Oh my gosh. She is an amazing singer. I have never heard anyone quite like her that I've known personally. Ariana Grande, she matches Ariana perfectly. I love listening to her sing Ariana Grande. When she will do it for me, I'm like, wow, that's my best friend. Look at her go. An angel cries, an angel cries, an angel cries. <laughs> I love that. Between her singing and her, let's say, vocabulary, Girl. <laughs> you probably would not have guessed. So I have moderate to severe autism. It's 
kind of hard to explain because it is a spectrum. When she told me, I was like, are you serious? Like, it took me a second to really like comprehend that. Like, I would never have been able to tell unless she told me. Jordan was diagnosed with autism when she was two. She went through occupational therapy and physical therapy. And her singing is especially impressive considering her 10 years of speech therapy. Would you say that you're luckier than most people on the autism spectrum? Absolutely, absolutely. Like I am like beyond blessed. Like I, I was told I shouldn't even be driving or singing. I'm so high functioning now because of how much intensive therapy I've received that I have the capability to not always need that, th that at all times. But it is hard to notice, but because of her autism, Jordan struggles with eye contact, picking up on sarcasm, and finding the appropriate facial expressions. She understands what she struggles with, but she also knows to focus on fixing those things. The years of therapy helped Jordan become very self-aware. So right now what I'm doing is I'm feeling the texture of this brick because it's a, it's a sensory thing. <laughs> People who have autism are really big on texture. All of your like senses are like heightened. So everything in life just is just so much brighter and like louder and like more interesting to touch. When she started at Kent State, Jordan wanted to live like any other student. She did not want any extra help, but with one class, she reached her limit. I was in a very desperate time in my life, and I was like, man, I, I can't do this by myself anymore. I, I really need some help. Jordan received help from Kent State's Office of Student Accessibility Services, SAS for short. SAS provides students with disabilities extra academic help, often in the form of extended time on tests, a private quiet room to take those tests, almost anything to help keep a student's disability from getting in the way of their schoolwork. I got exactly the perfect amount of time I needed on every test. It, it was so helpful and um, I, got, I even got directions read to me which was extremely, extremely helpful to me. Kent State's efforts to serve students with autism and other learning differences expanded a fair amount over the past several years. A handful of programs turned into the Autism Initiative for Research, Education, and Outreach. Hundreds of students, volunteers, staff, and faculty take part in these programs aimed at promoting academic and social success. The success of the Autism Initiatives did not go unnoticed. Three different websites named Kent State one of the best colleges in the country for students with autism. Lisa Audet is the coordinator of the university's Autism Initiative for Research, Education, and Outreach. And she's heavily involved in the school's autism resources. The university uh, is looking to embrace diversity, to give everybody a sense of place as part of its mission. The university has a long list of autism resources for students to get help. In addition to student accessibility services, the Autism Advocates Program assigns a university faculty or staff member to a student with autism to provide support throughout the school year. There are psychological services and a speech and hearing clinic. Kent State Autism Connections is a Facebook group and an online community where people on the autism spectrum, plus their family and friends, can go to comfortably to share information and ask each other questions. Disability is a room in the campus library where students with disabilities can go for an escape. The modest room has resource books, games, and sensory tools like these noise-canceling headphones. We can go into the disability room and relax, do homework, chill out, talk to other people. Corey Ullum is a disability regular, but with weather like this, he went around campus to take some photos instead. There's a beautiful tulip right there I want to get a picture of. Corey is a photography major. He is on the autism spectrum, and as his Ohio State football sweatshirt suggests, he's a huge sports fan. At one point, Corey worked as a sports photographer for Kent Wired, Kent State's student-run news organization. I think there's a relationship between photography and autism because it's something that you have to get used to, of course, something that takes time to develop, but you'll, you'll get the hang of it. That's a really good picture. 
because of his autism, Corey struggles having conversations and interacting with other people, especially strangers. Every time I try to go up to another person, I really get like very nervous. Something in my head just doesn't seem right, of course. Like I, my head's trying to say, of course, hey, you can't talk to that other person, of course. To help overcome this hurdle, Corey joined the university's PALS program. PALS stands for Partnering for Achievement and Learning Success. In this voluntary program, a student on the autism spectrum is paired with a neurotypical student. They become PALS. A neurotypical person is someone without autism or any other neurological disorders. PALS brings people together. They meet at least once a week during the semester. This week, Corey and his pal, Riley Boffman, had lunch together. If you could go anywhere in the world, where would you go? The purpose of PALS is to provide both students with a mentor, a companion, and a chance to learn about each other's experiences. All expenses covered, airfare, wherever you stay, food, everything. Hawaii. It's been really beneficial to me. I've been learning how to talk to other people more, how to like be able to keep the conversation going, learning how to like keep eye contact with another person. So meeting with Riley, having lunch, and just having regular conversation, that's kind of like practice for you. Yes, it really is. I really think it's helping practice with the interaction with other people. Yesterday, I celebrated one of my dog's birthdays. <gasps> Which one? Baxter, he turned 13 years old. Wow. Yes. Corey's pal Riley noticed his conversation skills improve since the time they met. You can just see the difference from the beginning of the semester. Both of us, you know, we both change, I believe. We both improve as people. The PALS program was designed that way for both students to benefit. They are paired as equals. Lisa Audet created the PALS program. She explained that people who do not really understand autism often impose many of the barriers people with autism face. It really was important to me when I developed PALS that we not communicate this less than impression of people with autism in hopes that the neurotypical population would begin to realize like, you know, I, 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 I'm part of this problem that keeps those people with autism oppressed. You know, we have individuals on the spectrum who are obtaining their PhDs in things like neurobiology. Well, it's really hard for me to sit across from somebody who's getting a PhD in neurobiology and say, yeah, well, you're disabled and I'm not. Audette believes that to better serve students with autism, three things need to happen. Students should be provided with guided leadership opportunities. Faculty and students need to be aware of the strengths and talents of students with autism. But perhaps most importantly, students with autism need a say in what these programs need. Audette actually thinks she can probably learn the most from students who are critical of the programs. It's not a top-down approach where, like, I'm a therapist and I know best, and so you, person with autism, I'm going to, you know, fix everything that's wrong with you, and then maybe someday you'll be good to go. Alongside Audette, the university has another key developer of its autism resources. Kent State's better off to have autistic students here and we're welcome to have them. Gina Campana works in the university's Division of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. She is involved with many of these programs, but she was key in the creation of Autism Connections Kent, which is run by students for students to promote autism acceptance on campus. Why is it so important that there are a number of programs rather than one or a couple? Because if you know one person with autism, you know one person with autism. So say this person here needs, really needs that quiet room or the extended time to take a test, but they might not need any of the other programs. Or there might be another person that needs all the services, but it's, they get to pick and choose, you know, what they, what they want and what's going to work best for them. One of Campana's biggest goals with these programs is for students to improve self-advocacy, to do a better job looking out for themselves. For example, Campana spoke about a student on the spectrum who, as a freshman, needed to be reminded to schedule classes or needed to be encouraged to call professors for help. As a senior, he took care of all that on his own. I definitely know that I'm way more mature and I can definitely communicate 
with professors and other authority figures much better than I used to. Campana knows this student pretty well. He is her son. I think she's doing a great job. Uh, it definitely shows how hard she tries. I definitely feel bad for the people out there that kind of have parents that don't really understand. As she developed these programs, Gina bounced ideas off Tristan. He said it was as if he could beta test the programs for his mom, which is a fitting way for Tristan to put it, since he worked IT at the university library and majored in digital sciences. Now, he is a graduate of Kent State University. To see him get here, it is, it is just so exciting. You know, people said, oh, he can't go to college. He's going to drop out. Well, guess what? He showed them. Yeah, he's graduating. Students like Tristan and Corey learned about these programs quickly and got involved right away. But other students, like Jordan, are unaware of most of these programs. Jordan found help with student accessibility services, but that is the only lifeline she knew about. And now that she's learned about the many other programs, she not only wants to get involved, she wants to help spread the word. Students on the autism spectrum are highly intelligent and they look at the world beautifully. If we don't begin to look at them as equals, they won't be able to contribute in the way that they should be able to contribute. People need to see people with autism prevailing and thriving and succeeding, and it's so drastically important. Navigating the Underground Railroad through a labyrinth of secret signs, obscure landmarks, and hidden markers in search of freedom was an unimaginable hardship. Most slaves traveled late at night to avoid capture. Photographer Janine Mishna Bales offers people an idea what it might have been like in an exhibit currently on view at the Canton Museum of Art. Through darkness to light, photographs along the Underground Railroad shares images taken at night along some of the routes traveled by men and women who ventured north for better lives. For more, Ideastream's Dan Paletta sat down with Christy Davis, curator of exhibitions at the Canton Museum of Art. She's trying to give you the perspective of the freedom seekers and what they experienced. I mean, they had to travel at night. Um, it was the safest time to travel, um, safe being the operative word there, but um, it shows you what they were seeing. So, you know, there wasn't light pollution from the cities or any of those things. And so these are really dark images because that's how it would have looked. And if you think of the South and all of the creatures and animals that come into that and just, yeah, that unknown of everything. I mean, it's, yeah, it's an intimidating thought, yeah. She could have told this story from any number of different perspectives. For example, she could have told it from a station master, a conductor. Instead, she decided to tell it through the, the slaves who are escaping for freedom, why did she decide to tell the, that story from this particular perspective? Most of these freedom seekers, the, the slaves, they weren't getting that much aid along the way, especially in the Deep South. There were very few accounts of slaves from the Deep South making it to Canada. There were some, but not near as many as, you know, from the Kentucky border, things like that. Um, and many times they were on their own. So when they were standing in these places that you see in the photographs, they were by themselves. Um, and there were station masters, there were station houses, but they were few and far between. So it was really a lot of times a solo trip. So how does documenting the story of the Underground Railroad through pictures of enable her to tell us a different story than what we would read in text? She portrays it in a first person narrative, first person perspective, where you really, in looking at the images, you are getting the sense that you're standing where that person stood, especially with the large format images. Um, it's easier to put yourself in that place. Um, you can really sense that kind of fear of the unknown in some of these photos with, um, you know, you're walking into a swamp, the nature in the swamp. 
um, the fear of being detected, all of those things. So it's really powerful. What prompted Janine McNabale's interest in the story of the Underground Railroad? Um, well, she really has a vested interest in the relationship between history and um, its effect on now. Um, the Underground Railroad project has really been, it was a 14-year project. She started in 2002. This was before the National Underground Railroad Freedom Center in Cincinnati, and so she really focused on um, wanting to draw the comparisons between history and now. She spent a decade researching these routes. How did she go about determining where the spots were that she wanted to photograph, especially given that there's not much historical evidence of what slaves may have taken in terms of routes, where they may have gone, where they may have stopped? There really isn't because there was such a risk in um, documenting that information because if it was found, you risk not only yourself but also the people that you were aiding. Um, and she chose like the 1840s, so everything that she photographed was operating as a station house or could have been in that decade. Um, and she kept everything, each image goes about 20 miles apart from each other. So um, history stories say that um, fugitive slaves were escaping, or freedom seekers were escaping and going 20 miles per night on their journey. So she tried to keep that much distance between each image that she shot. One of the most haunting photos, I think, is decision to leave. What do we see in this picture? So that is actually a picture of um, slave quarters at the Magnolia Plantation, Louisiana, that still stands as a National Park Service site. Um, and to my understanding, often the slaves would consider leaving, maybe go the next town over for a day or two, but then come back. So what you see in that image is really that last glance back to what they've known as their home. Um, and before they decide to leave that to try for a better life. There seems so. to be almost a look over your shoulder. Kind yeah, of. it really is. The, the, the photo seems to communicate to me anyway, like, should I go, should I yeah, not go? Yeah, exactly. The risk of staying versus the, the hope of what could be. In terms of the way she frames her shot, is it fair to say that Mick Bale seems to point us toward freedom, but it's still elusive, like you feel it over the yeah. edge, but. Yeah, and the later, um, towards the end of the series, uh, the shots of Canada where you see sunrise, you're still seeing Canada across the water. You're not on Canadian soil quite yet. So it is really, it's, it's at least within reach. You can see it. Up next, when designer Lucis Royster disassembled a $3,000 handbag at a shop in Laguna Beach, California 12 years ago, he knew he could create a higher quality purse. Today, his passion is going strong in Cleveland. In this installment of Making It, Ideastream's series highlighting Northeast Ohio entrepreneurs, we discover the art of handbag design. Well, it's a little bit classic and a little bit bohemian and a little bit fashion forward. I kind of mix them all up. Hello, my name is Lucis Royster, and I am a leathersmith and designer. Well, my mother was a seamstress, and um, I wanted to make a shirt, and she said, you could do it, so I said, I'll try. So I made my first garment on this machine right here, and I was in love with this ever since. I make almost anything, men's suits, women's suits, dresses. I never took a class in bag making. I just studied bags, you know? I had a shop in Laguna Beach. So one of my customers, she brought in a $3,000 bag. She says, Lou, can you fix my bag? I took that bag apart. I'm going, $3,000? I could do better than this. That night, I made up my first bag. And I started going to the Goodwill, buying bags and taking them apart and checking them out. And then after I got it down, I just started making my own patterns. I watch, I look and see, you know, what, what women are doing. I once scared the hell out of a lady and, uh, and I kept staring at her bag and she noticed me. And I ended up saying, ma'am, I'm sorry, but I make bags and that's a very interesting bag. First thing I do, I get an idea. I start thinking how I would make the bag. Then I start making a pattern. This purse we're working on, this is that pattern. And this is the strap. That's the main body right there. 
Okay, so what we're gonna do, we're gonna set this zipper. It goes on like this, that down. Now what we're gonna do, we're gonna go over to that sewing machine over there. Okay, that foot right there is lined right up with the edge of this, so it'll give you a good straight stitch. There we have a pocket. So the lady could put all her husband's money in there. This purse right here, I've done, I don't know how many times, it's a hot purse, it sells a lot. We've been doing this purse for about seven years. Great thing that you can do something that you love and get paid for, but a lot of people don't realize one of the biggest rewards that I get in this, when my customer says, oh, I love that, you know? Okay, so I'm sewing this flap onto the lining. I didn't take this serious for a long time. You know, it was just something that I love to do, you know. But I'm serious now. I really want to get my bags out there. I mean, I want everyone to know and carry my bags. So my goal is to really, really focus on marketing my product. Now what we're going to do, we're going to put that zipper in. This is the lining. It's um, a really soft suede. Okay, this is the strap. That's that. We have a bag. I get up every morning just as excited about this business as I was when I was 13. I still want to go see what happens today, what I can create, you know. I know where I'm shopping for Christmas. That's going to do it for us for this morning. The State of Ohio with Karen Kassler is up next. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Rick Jackson. Brought to you by Westfield, offering insurance to protect what's yours, grow your business, and achieve your dreams.